I want to show you a video um, that Dr. Gabriel Cousins gave the other day. Uh, we have 80 speakers at this conference. Um, a lot of passionate, smart, educated people, but they don't all say the same thing. Um, Gabriel Cousins said something very different than many of the whole food plant-based speakers we that we have. He eats a whole food plant-based diet, but he had some different conclusions that were in contrast to the way, to the things that many of our speakers are saying. I want to show you some highlights of what he said and then ask for your feedback. And a high carbohydrate diet. So when Joe Furman talks about, well, he sees a lot of people with vegans with brain uh, you know, degeneration. Um, I look at the high carbohydrate diet, which I don't support because it stimulates brain inflammatory pathways. Now, to me, this is a really important study, the Journal of Alzheimer's 12, 12, 2012. I'm just going to read it because it's so important. Older people, and I, we're talking people above 60, eating a high carbohydrate diet. Get the word high carbohydrate because we're told a lot in the vegan world that you want a high, high complex carbohydrate diet. People are talking about 70% carbohydrate. Yeah, well, here's the result. Have nearly four times the risk of, of, of developing mild cognitive impairment. So this is what David Pulmoner in his book, Grain Brain, uh, I thought you did really good work. A diet heavy in inflammatory carbohydrates, which mostly they are, low in healthy fats, messes with the mind in more ways than one. But let's say messes with the brain in more ways than one. So. Fat is the preferred fuel of human metabolism, and it's been that way through evolution until we started farming about 10,000 years ago. Next. And this is one of the second reasons I, I think that vegans tend to get more Alzheimer's. Because people with the highest cholesterol scored higher on cognitive tests than those with lower cholesterol levels. So this is my um, triple spinal fluid. That is really important. As 2007 study showed that people who are regularly consumed omega-3, this is one of the supplements I'm going to talk about, they were 60% less likely to develop dementia than those who didn't regularly consume such oils. That's DHA and EPA. High cholesterol is associated with better memory function. And it's the preferred fuel for your heart. I mentioned the um, so atrial fibrillation. High omega-3, 85% lower risk of dying from all causes. Okay, Any anything you want to, or please comment on that if you could. Yeah, it fits exactly with everything I've said, exactly. So what we've said is it's about inflammation, which is lowered by things like omega-3s and which is increased by carbohydrates. Ketoflex 12-3 is a high good fats, high uh, phytonutrients, high fiber, mildly ketogenic diet. So it fits perfectly. Now, the cholesterol part, yeah, interesting, but it depends. I mean, the cholesterol is got many different forms you we're talking about here. So for people who have very high, for example, ApoB, for people who have very high LDL particle numbers, that's associated with strokes and associated with cognitive decline. On the other hand, having a normal or even high cholesterol with good fats, with where you've got uh, reasonable LDL particle numbers, uh, appropriate ApoB, then they tend to do better. So everything that he said is exactly in line with what we've published. And I would also say anyone for any opinion, take patience, treat them, do a trial, publish your data so that everybody can see it. We've done that. 
And we've shown that 84% in our studies actually got better. So that's, you know, that's the acid test. Can you actually make people better with what you're doing? There are lots of claims out there, all sorts of things. But um, just as, as Michael was saying a few minutes ago, they published their results. It shows there was improvement. So that's the that's the acid test you got to show. So yeah, I mean, everything that was said there fits very well with what we're doing. And KetoFlex is a mostly good fats diet. So when you say good fats, does that mean seeds, nuts, olives, avocados? Yes, monounsaturates and polyunsaturates. And so things like, yeah, uh, omega-3s. Um, and as I say, monounsaturates, yes, seeds, nuts, things like that. You don't want to have so many nuts that you end up with a high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. You want to keep your ratio, you know, one to one up to four to one or so. You don't want to be sitting up at 15 to one, which is the standard American diet ratio. Uh, but yes, but having nuts, having seeds, these are all appropriate. And what about oil? Yeah, now there's, a, of course, there's some controversy. And, you know, you mentioned that there's there are differences of opinion. Of course there are. This is a complex subject. And, you know, this is one of the things that shows us we're, you know, we're all making progress because there is disagreement about exactly how to do it. But uh, so the people who don't like oils say, look, oils are a processed food. That is true. But cold pressed oils, minimally processed, and they are no question can be very helpful. And again, go back to things like and can be very helpful. And again, go back to things like omega threes. And I would also mention things like the resolvins. Uh, Professor Charles Searhan at Harvard has done such beautiful work over the years on discovering resolvins and characterizing them. Uh, and you know, if you take high amounts of omega threes, you're going to produce some resolvins. So they're good for preventing inflammation. They're also good for resolving inflammation. They're also good for structure of membranes. All of these things can be helpful. And what about beans and whole grains like quinoa, millet, amaranth, teff, buckwheat, wild rice? Yeah. So uh, those, well, the ones you've mentioned are actually better than others. But in general, what we avoid uh, are, number one, simple carbs, of course. I think everyone agrees with that. Um, and then gluten and other grains because of the issue of leaky gut. So we do uh, avoid gluten and we do tend to avoid other grains. And I know that is another area of controversy. Many people say, well, whole grains are good. Um, we tend to get better results when we avoid the whole grains. And then dairy, dairy is inflammatory. And so we avoid dairy as well. Um, and then the last would be, and only if you're having trouble with them, would be lectins. And certainly uh, Dr. Stephen Gundry has written a book about lectins, uh, only for those who have big issues with uh, autoimmune disease are we concerned about lectins. But he's certainly made a strong case for avoiding those as well. So we end up, yeah, with a diet that avoids those major groups hmm. um, and focuses on a high fat, mildly ketogenic, you know, plant rich, mildly ketogenic diet. Yeah. And I, and I would just say too, that in terms of fat, sometimes it gets conflated. It's the type of fats because they can be a good yeah. delivery system, but you just have to be careful. Like the omegas are good. A lot of people have had, it's found myself, people have had really good results with that. Yeah. Quentin Uber, who's going to speak at our conference says the best thing for inflammation is grounding, which means walking barefoot on the grass and the sand in the ocean. Is this, should we all walk around for two hours every day barefoot on the grass to fight inflammation? Or is this just a mild thing that well, it's not going to make that big a difference either way? Well, I think you'd have to ask him about all the data on, on grounding. But uh, I think it's fantastic to get out there in your bare feet and, and spend some time. However, there are many other things that are anti-inflammatory as well, beginning with your diet and including your lifestyle and including things like curcumin and propolis and omega-3s, uh, all of these things. There, there's so much for anti-inflammation. Ginger is another good one. Um, you know, just, just the foods that you're eating uh, can be so helpful. So yeah, I think uh, in, uh, inflammation is something um, that I think we can all do very, very well with. The critical piece, and what which people don't talk about nearly enough, is that you need to understand what's causing the inflammation. So you buy yourself some time by starting anti-inflammatories and resolving inflammation. But whatever it is that's causing 
You, you've got to, you, it's causing that inflammation. You've got to identify it and remove it. It may be that you have chronic tick-borne illness like Lyme disease or Ehrlichia uh, or, or Babesia or one of those. It may be that you've got some candida or you've got a leaky gut or you've got a poor oral microbiome, you know, herpes simplex, I mean, on and on and on. There are many reasons to have chronic inflammation. And this idea of, well, we're just going to take an anti-inflammatory, that is a short-term solution. You need then to follow that up with finding mm. what's causing it and getting rid of it. So how, yeah. how, does, how does someone get rid of inflammation? Just the lifestyle? And well, no, that's the whole point. You need to find out what's driving, what's causing. Why you're, so inflammation is normal when your body is responding. You have a two-part response. You have your immune system has a uh, has the the innate part of the immune system, which is what creates the inflammation. It's basically telling you, okay, Stephen, something's wrong. Things are bad. We're going to activate this whole pathway, just like you do with COVID nineteen. And unfortunately, there are a lot of parallels between COVID nineteen and Alzheimer's. So we're very concerned about people. We already know there's been a publication showing people who had COVID nineteen are at increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. So again. Please, everybody, get a cognoscopy, get on active prevention, don't wait. And then the second part is it hands it off to a much more specific, the adaptive immune system, which is your T cells and B cells and your antibodies and things like that. So getting rid of the inflammation is, is getting rid of a normal response of your body to something. So yes, the inflammation is producing symptoms and increasing your likelihood for heart disease and for cancers and for neurodegeneration, but it's there for a reason. So you need to find out if you have specific infections, if you've changed your oral microbiome, what is it? And then you need to address that. It may be that you have to take acyclovir for a few months. Uh, it may be that you have to take some uh, antibiotics to get or or, or uh, herbal approaches to get rid of Lyme disease. You know, there are all sorts of causes of it. So it's not enough just to address the inflammation. You have to address what causes it. And Stephen, if I can piggyback on that, um, one of the things that osteopathy really uh, looks at in cranial is that when you're when you're actually looking and listening to the body, you can kind of tell from different sites a little bit of the entry point. So is I uh, say to many of my students, we're not just chasing the symptoms, we're looking for the generator at a deep level, what's in the body. And complementary to all this testing is we're looking to see what the restriction patterns are that are already existing in the brain. So I agree that what we wanna do is look at whether it's a vector, whether it's external from some car accident or blow to the body, it may be something that's inflammatory because of food, it may be something that's throwing things off hormonally, it could even be toxicity from somebody's imbibed, whether they know it or not, you know, some trace amounts of mercury or cadmium or aluminum or like that. So those are all factors you wanna look at to see what exactly is uh, the vector of that. <laughs>